Welcome in to K-State Online. I'm Mason Both. That is Derek Young. We are here uh, ready to go, as uh, you can see right there in the, the corner of the screen. 151 days until kick. It, it starts to maybe not seem like so long, but then when you put it into a day's number, you go, eh, okay, we still got a ways to go. But there is sort of football going on right now for K-State. Spring ball continues with some of the practices and everything. And Another look for you this morning, D.Y., to get in there and kind of see what's going on. And I think most people probably know, but it's probably a good reminder, uh, the portion of practice that is seen by people outside of the football program, it's not anything earth-shattering. So do not uh, expect you know anything too crazy to get out there. But there is always some things that you can glean from it, whether it be who's doing what or, in some cases, who isn't involved in things. But – were there any significant takeaways from what you saw this morning uh, at, at K-State practice, D.Y.? Yeah, we've been able to see some plays at least and some, uh, you know, 11 on 11 stuff. So a little bit more than probably we're anticipating. Um, sometimes it is about who's not doing anything. Like today you saw there was designated rest for Carver Willis who's been seeing a lot of that this spring, same being with uh, Desmond Purnell. I think uh, VJ Payne as well. Uh, didn't see him out there. So guys that you just just aren't getting a lot of action. And today DJ Giddens was uh, uh, not on the shelf with an injury, but a guy that they were not really uh, forcing to be out there and, and participating, getting some uh, probably much needed rest and, and the reason why he was probably able to do that is because Davon Rice was back at practice today. So um, that that was probably another takeaway. Donovan McIntosh was a corner with the twos today. Now, I've said all along that I think they need to build depth at cornerback. I think they're probably pretty confident in Justice James, who's seen some snaps. And he was the other corner with the twos. But they need to build something you know, beyond just Keenan Garber and Jacob Parrish. So Donovan McIntosh you know, was a guy that seemed to be taking those reps uh, on this particular day. Hadley Panzer uh, was not like a first-team center, I think, in the first two practices that we saw, but there were clips out there, mainly the ones that highlighted Avery Johnson's throws to Jace Brown that were looking pretty impressive, obviously, uh, that found their way on Instagram. Uh, you saw Panzer at center today. We saw Panzer at center as well with Andrew Lyngang being the right guard. And, and I believe uh, it was probably Taylor Portier left guard. Um, but, I, you know, some of that's losing. Some of that's a little bit fleeting. But Had Hadley Panzer was certainly the center. Sam Hecht was the center with the twos, uh, you know, snapping the ball to Jacob Knuth today. So, um, and, and we had some guys that were either taking some rest that hadn't been taking rest or were injured. or And, and none of them looked significant that uh, maybe weren't before. Um, I think Uso Sayamalo um, recovering from surgery. Jay Clifton recovering from surgery. Asa Newsom recovering from surgery. But then you also had Brendan Mott, Austin Romain, and uh, Jace Brown taking it pretty easy today as well. Yeah, so I guess offensive line is one of those spots that probably up until we see K-State play an actual game, there will be questions about just because you lose so much and there's going to be uh, a lot of intrigue on who's getting what spots because uh, this is another spot similar to a lot of the areas of defense for K-State that we'll talk about where I think you feel okay that K-State has guys to put out there that can can help you win, but you just don't know how they're going to be aligned. Uh, I mean, are, where's your confidence sit right now with the offensive line that K-State could put out there game one and probably more importantly – uh, once they get to game three when Arizona comes to town and you're facing power four competition? Maybe it's uh, ill-advised by me, but I'm still pretty confident in this unit. Uh, everyone knows I'm quite the Connor Riley fan, and he's had a really good offensive line every single year. Some people say, well, that's because he still has you know recruits from the prior um, coaching staff. Well, to, a, to an extent, that was the case. Obviously, Cooper, BB, Christian Duffy, and KT Leviston were, but there were three contributors last year. And on and sometimes starters last year that Connor Riley recruited. Now it was Hadley Panzer, Carver Wills, and Taylor Portier. That was the staff. And yeah, KT Leviston, Christian Duffy, and Cooper Reby might have been the last staff, 
but Kyle O'Reilly coached them for four years. So they are the products they were as, as a result of his coaching. And, and that still says something. So I, I feel really good about this unit. We, I think we brushed on this the last time and, or, and actually I think it was with the three mile group and I forgot who the right tackle was, but the first uh, offensive line unit that Connor Riley had was definitely all Bill Snyder guys, obviously. And you had five seniors, I believe, in that group, or the way that they constructed it when you had Adam Holtorf, Tyler Mitchell, mm-hmm. Scott France, Nick Kaltmeyer, and there was someone else that we keep forgetting um, for some reason that, that must have played one of the guard spots. But um, in addition to the interior of the offensive line, next to what would have been Adam Holtorf and Tyler Mitchell, one more. I don't know why um, that keeps failing me. But anyways, I remember they, had, they started five seniors on their offensive line, and they were all gone. Everyone's like, well, we'll find out how good of a coach Connor Riley is. You hear this every year. Well, he brought in five new starters, and it was still a really damn good unit. So, you know, I just, you know, I don't take everything away from that. And then you ran, and then they ran into the COVID year too, and that kind of got things got topsy turvy just about everywhere. Obviously, when this team went four and six, uh, but you know, Cooper Beebe's going to the pros not because he was coached by someone else. He was coached by Connor Riley. Um, I think John Pastore all he needs is experience, get a couple snaps on a few snaps under his belt. He's a guy that would have played, you know, a lot of other places. But guess what? The reason why he didn't play is not because he hasn't been developing. One, it's because he's been a little banged up, but two, it's because hey, the tackles have been pretty freaking good, too, right? Do you really want him to play ahead of KT Leviston, who's going to be in the NFL this year? Probably not. Andrew Lingate, where is he at? Why is he not developing? Who says he's not developing? Do you want him to play ahead of Cooper Beebe? You know, these are the, the questions that you have to ask. And I keep hearing that Sam Hecht is going to, is probably even better than Hayden Gillum, um, which is, you know, saying something. And he's not even the guaranteed starter because you could just do Hadley Panther at center, make your guards, line gang, and Portier. There's a lot of versatility in this group. I think a lot of talent, a lot of upside. It might be a slow starter. Actually, most of the offensive lines under Connor Riley have started a little slow out of the gates, at least, in, you know, in the first two or three weeks. But at the end of the day, I, I have a lot of confidence in this unit as a whole. Well, and I, I think you make a, a good point there about what was in front of guys because we talk a lot about, okay, obviously you had a guy like Cooper Beebe. You, nobody's going to take take his spot or take reps away from him when it matters. And then you look around in other elements where, uh, you, you know, you talk about Sam Heck, you know, maybe he, he ends up being better or was better than Hayden Gillum, but – so much of the offensive line is, I think, once you find continuity and those five guys know how to work together, and then there's comfort with whoever's at quarterback, and obviously Hayden Gillum and Will Howard were comfortable with each other. I don't think you want to upset the apple cart too much and, and disrupt yep. the flow because I think offensive line more than anywhere, it's so important for those guys to be in tune with each other uh, because, I mean, that's that's like the one true spot on the field where – it's a legit unit and not an individual type of Absolutely. game. Yeah, I've, I've been told it a number of times. I know some fans kind of roll their eyes because they don't think it's the way it works. You could have five super studs on the offensive line and have no chemistry and it'd be a terrible unit. And you could have five guys lesser talented than those five, but play together well and it'll be better. Because like Cooper BBKT Leviston, that thing got going was perfect, right? But they don't. They wouldn't have played as well with someone that they didn't have next to them as much. It's It really is. Offensive line, it's a delicate balance when you're talking between talent, chemistry, cohesion, continuity, experience. All of those things matter. Um, and you want you need to have a guy or two that basically knows everyone else's job and can tell them what to do because you're, you're making mm-hmm. a lot of calls as an offensive line too, especially with a young quarterback they'll have this year. Yeah, it's a good point. Well, uh, speaking of young quarterback, let's, let's give uh, everybody what they want. What's the the latest Avery Johnson update? Is he still looking as special as always? Yeah, yeah, he's he's really good. It ball comes out of his hand, really, uh, you know, amazing. It's uh, I mean, you you hear different compliments, praise, raves about him every single week. I know I do. And then when I want, and he's not the complete package yet. He's going to have some growing pains, I'm sure. And if he doesn't, he's, he's a unicorn, but boy, when you watch him play there, you see the talent just that kind of spews out and it hasn't looked that way under center at Kansas state, you know, at least since I've been here, but I'm probably would imagine it extends further than that. Like he, he is a different type of dude. 
and he's going to be an exciting watch for Kansas State fans for hopefully at least two years. Um, I doubt it's more than that anywhere. He is special. Well, and we, we've now seen numerous quarterbacks since Chris Kleiman's been here, and obviously then some at the end of the, the Snyder regime. I mean, the the way in which he's grasped it all so quickly, and then every step of the way it seems like you try and get people to go, okay, it's not easy what he's doing, and living up to expectations is not always going to be what occurs, but he's done it at each and every step. So, I mean – is that what we're looking at this year? I know that you're saying like, hey, there are still going to be some bumps because he is young and he's only started one game at the position at this level. But, I mean, are, what does that look like? What does a bump for Avery Johnson look like compared to uh, a bump for, you know, like sophomore Skylar Thompson? Yeah, it's a good question. That's uh, – I haven't heard anyone ask it as well as you did right there that's uh, you know, you can't do better than that and it's probably su such a good question and he is so different than anyone else in terms of talent just natural raw ability but none of us can really answer that because he has a chance because of his talent and how special he is and the way he thinks the game and how hard he works to really make errors not look like errors too like <laughs> You know, I remember I think it was a few months ago when we were talking. I said he is a cha he's the type of guy that makes an average offensive coordinator or any can make any offense coordinator look really good. Um, just like he can make a lot of mistakes go away. So his, you know, bump in the road, growing pain, will be probably drastically different than someone like a Skylar Thompson or even a Will Howard or Jake Rupley and you know all Jesse Ertz. I'm trying to go through all the quarterbacks. Did I miss one in that era? I don't think so. Uh, um, Alex Delton, come on. Alex Delton. Ace uh, <laughs> yeah, Alex Delton. So we'll see. Because uh, I want to say typically it exudes itself or, or presents itself or manifests itself with interceptions and fumbles. But, boy, he looked like he was – 30-year-old vet out there in terms of ball security, knowing when to throw it away, when not to, when to tuck it, and when not to during the Pop-Tarts Bowl against NC State. Well, and I think it, answering the question about what's a bump in the road look like for him versus other guys, I think that's an answer that ultimately you're in a tough spot to answer it because I don't think Chris Kleiman and you know last year Colin Klein, this year Matt Wells and Connor Riley – I don't think they actually know the true answer. I think there are a lot of other guys where, you know, some of the mistakes that Will Howard made early in his career, I think that they no doubt would have been able to say, yeah, we, we expect this to happen for a guy that young, especially what 2020 Will Howard was. Like, that was a guy, COVID year, so you had all that going on, and now he's thrust into being the starting quarterback, you know, three, four games into the season. Like, that was probably predictable. Um, you could probably predict some of the other things that would go on and errors that would happen with, you know, when Skylar Thompson was here and everything. But I think Avery Johnson is so different and they're experiencing this in real time that every time we hear Chris Kleiman talk about Avery Johnson, it, it does come across like he's not necessarily stunned at how easy he's making it look and how well he's adjusting to everything that's thrown his way. But he wants to make sure that the uh, – accurate amount of credit is given because there aren't a lot of guys that have handled it like he would. And that's not even just from like the off the field standpoint, but purely from the performance standpoint, uh, I don't know many guys that handle it better than what Avery Johnson did through the first year and how it seems like he's kind of continuing that into uh, his first full season as a starter. Yeah. Thinking more about it. I wonder if a bump in the road is more maybe taking off with his legs, maybe bailing out of a good pocket yeah. uh, a few times and, and, and it sinks a drive or two, or, you know, we saw this a little bit in the bowl game, the footwork gets a little wonky when he's throwing on the run. So maybe he runs into a cold spell accuracy wise, where he just can't hit his guys on the mark the way that he would like. And all of a sudden you kind of go cold and three or four drives stall because then teams kind of feast on your running game a little bit. That can't take off, and Avery's arm just isn't there for some reason. Has a bad game with accuracy, 
um, as a young player that probably isn't a masterful tactician or, or masterful technician yet. I think you could run into that. Maybe some accuracy problems where you go on a cold streak because your footwork and your fundamentals get all out of whack. Cause I think we did see that like the third quarter, I think people harped on the play calling a little bit, which was probably deserved to an extent, but I don't think Avery Johnson did them any favors with, you know, some of his problematic footwork, which was especially throwing on the run where you saw the ball skipping a little bit, even to open receivers. So, um, I think those mechanics, you know, those those footwork kind of stuff that that's probably what will be the best way to gauge and grade and and judge and I and I say that and it sounds from like from a critical standpoint I don't mean that but just to see the strides that he is making and and the work that Matt Wells has done if the, if they can make a giant and um, strides in that area. Well, we'll see how it uh, works out. A lot more time this offseason for Avery Johnson to kind of keep gearing up, as will everybody else on the team, and we'll have more spring football updates uh, throughout the offseason and as practices continue on before they wind down, and Chris Kleiman will give one last big recap on everything else that happens. So that'll do it for this uh, edition of the KSO Show. We'll be back tomorrow with more on K-State football and basketball, and uh, whenever breaking news hits about K-State, you can also come right back here, whether it's a commit from the transfer portal or somebody entering the transfer portal or who knows what else might happen football wise. I would hope this time of the year we don't get any like breaking football news because more times than not, it's probably it's probably going to be a bad thing if you get breaking football news unless uh, you get one of those transfer portal stragglers, which K-State is looking around on. So if you want to be in the know on all that, head over to kstateonline.com and uh, follow along with the Cats because D.Y. and Drew will keep you covered there. So for Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. Thanks for watching and listening to K-State Online.